We're going to have to check and make sure what this gives us. Sorry, these are plug so da -da -da. Hello and welcome to another Retro Crazy. So who's heard of Science of Cambridge Limited? No? Well, they became Sinclair Research and this, the ZX80, was released back in January 1980. Available as a kit for $79.95 or fully assembled for $99.95, that would equate to a whopping £541 today. It was one of the first home computers you could buy at under £100 here in the UK, but wasn't without its flaws. It only came with 1K of RAM, a poor keyboard, the screen blanked during program execution, and it suffered from overheating. Yeah, those are not cooling slots on the top. It would be replaced after a year by the Sinclair ZX81, but this didn't stop it having a purchase waiting list. I picked this up with a collection of other machines, which you can watch here. And it's about time I opened this up and we find out what's inside and if it even works. I know there's some damage to the port in the back and the case has seen better days, but we can but hope. Oh, I've also had this sat in a window for a few weeks sun brightening as it was much yellower than this originally. You can see the damage on the back. This port, which is the ear port, is very, very broken. Now, it is a formed plastic. It's pushed through pins that open up another pin to hold everything together, so it's all sandwiched. And yeah, it has seen much better days. So let's start at the beginning, and you know where that is. That's with the power supply. But just before we do that, one thing I did forget. Just shortly after I recorded the video of unboxing all this, she sent me through the original manual as well. So I even have the original Science of Cambridge manual for the ZX80. Right. Let's have a look in here and let's get the power supply running first. Power supplies are dangerous. There are components in these that can hold a charge long after they're unplugged from the mains. So if you're unsure of what you're doing, go seek professional advice. So this is a 9 volt at half an amp power supply. So based on the weight, there's a transformer in here. There's probably Let's have a look, it's DC, so there's going to be some diodes to rectify down to DC from AC and probably at least one if not two capacitors. So let's pop this open. So there we are, we've got some very thin wires for mains voltage coming in to the board itself, straight into transformer. We've got a bridge rectifier network here, which you can just see tucked down here, and a single capacitor. So this is a thousand UF at 16 volts. So let's get this out and get a nice modern replacement in. And there we are. They are very simple and straightforward to do when they're as basic as this. One capacitor and it's held together with some flat blade screwdriver screws. Right, next we're going to have to check and make sure that this is giving out the right voltage. So let's plug this in and test. 
Well, first thing I'll need to do is switch on at the wall. So here we go. No pops, no bangs. That's always a good start. Let's find out what we get at this end. Yep, so for a 9 volt, half an amp, that's uh, 15 and a half volts. That's about normal. Obviously, what's a little bit more worrying is I don't think I saw any form of fuse in there. And I'm also noticing the end of this connector is moving. Right. So the power supply is fine. But I'll show you what I mean. Let me just pop this off. Right, ignore my uh, painted fingers. I have been doing some model painting today. But look, hopefully you can see that moving independently of the outer. So there is a little bit of wear there. Luckily, once this has been tested and hopefully it works, it'll be getting packed away and into storage because I am predominantly a collector and yeah. I've got other computers that can do the job of the ZX80, these days especially when they're getting so valuable. While I will break it out occasionally, I'm not going to be running it constantly. Right, with the power supply done, let's shove this to the side and bring in the ZX80 itself. So as we saw earlier, this has a cheaply moulded plastic case but it's going to be very fragile. It's already cracked in a few small places. There's pressure here from pretty much the heat sink from the voltage regulator by the looks of it. So these are solid plugs that have been pushed through little nylon or plastic split pins. So I'm gonna to have to gently push each one of these out and see if we can carefully get this apart. Yeah, these do not want to come out. This is going to be quite a challenge to do this without breaking everything. I mean, you can see there's a crack here, there's a crack here, there's a crack here, there's a crack here. Yeah, it's, uh, it's seen better days. And there we are, our first look inside the ZX80. And it was supposed to be pretty much designed around off the shelf components. So yeah, very simple, very straightforward. Now I've still got one to come out, but I think I'm lucky because it's lifted free because this is the one with the corner missing, unfortunately. I did have this corner fracture slightly but that's really not surprising so I have one two three nylon clips which come right the way through so I've got to lift those off to get the rest of the board out and there we are it's all out now what I can tell you is this piece of damage here on the top casing. It's caused by this screw and that's just pushing on here, causing the whole lot to push up and therefore fracture. Not sure we can do much about that unless we can get a much lower profile screw to fit in. This is an extra heat sink that looks like somebody has added to try and keep it cool. I mean, it could be a Sinclair original, who knows? It's just got a bit of tape to stop it coming down too far and shorting on the RF shield. But it's going to need a little bit of a clean because look at the state of the connector. I want to clean up the RF, replace what I'm going to guess is a 7805. Yep, 7805. We'll get some decent thermal paste on there as well and there are at least two capacitors to replace. There's one here, and there's one tucked down in here. And again, typical Sinclair, keeping costs down. There's no conformal coating on the top of the traces, 
So any soldering you do, you've got to be careful because if you get any splashes, it will stick to these traces. So getting shorts is a real possibility. Okay, so let's pop all of this off and then let's look at replacing the 7805, the two capacitors and this very poorly looking ear socket. I'm not quite sure. I've got a piece of paper there though. Right, let's crack on. So with everything done and recapped, I was ready to reassemble and then I noticed R34. Now that has actually been desoldered. Looking at the back of the board, there is a solder point. I do not know why it's been desoldered, I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, confused, I'm going to have to look that up. Um, hmm. Very strange. Right, I've done some digging and I can find no reason why that particular resistor has been desoldered. There's nothing listed anywhere. It appears to be a 1K resistor that affects the mic socket. So let's just check it is a 1K. And yep, spot on 1K. So I don't know why it's been dis disconnected. Hold on. The cap's been disconnected as well, C13. Okay, now I'm totally confused. I have not got a clue why that would have been done. Now, if I remember, C13 is also part of the mic socket. So why it's been disabled, I don't know. Very strange. I'm just going to double check actually. We don't have a short circuit. No, there's, there's a short, I think, on the mic socket. Okay, be right back. Right, I think I've got to the bottom of it. I'm not sure who did any rework previously or what rework was actually done. However, this was one blob of solder. And I decided just to lift it up and clean it all. And there's no connection there. They're not supposed to be connected. This resistor on this side here goes into this capacitor and then heads that way through a jump. And there's no connection there, or they're not supposed to be. So I've removed that solder. I've reconnected the the missing resistor and the missing capacitor so hopefully now we can pop it together and find out if indeed this thing lives so that's as far as I'm actually going to assemble it at the moment and the reason for that is these are easy to take out and I've only put these two in at the moment however the plastics are so fragile I don't want to risk forcing all of these in and then having to take them back out. I would normally, you've seen me before, do a full reassembly. Yes, I'm a, my own worst enemy, but in this instance, I want to test. I want to find out what's going on before I even think about putting this on. Plus, I'm gonna have to take this off and I'm tempted to actually file that down considerably so that it's not putting pressure on. I think that would be a sensible thing to do. The plastics have still to have a bit of a wash, but I'm going to be very, very careful because I don't want any of this to come off. So I'm only going to be giving it a damp, a damp sponge wash. Let's clear the bench and let's find out if this thing actually even works. Well, that's everything hooked up. So let's power on and see if we get anything on the TV at all. 
Well, the good news is we don't get smoke. But at this moment in time, there's nothing on the telly, so bear with me a second while I try tuning. Oh, oh, it's close. We do get something on the telly. <gasps> She lives! Okay, let me see if I can tune this telly a bit better. Okay, about as good as I'm going to get it, but she lives. Now the question is, does the keyboard work? <laughs> we got life! Okay, we're going to definitely need to do a composite mod because the LCD TV I'm using does not like working. However, what I am seeing is the lines are getting bigger so I can't believe the keyboard is is running it's it's all going now there's the classic uh, refresh and you can actually see the screen going black each time I press a key and that's because of the way this works but that's running the keyboards working uh, the ZX80 lives superb so now I know it lives I am very very happy I don't know if I've got any software I can load on this that's a very good question not that I'm going to get a good picture with it <laughs> let's, let's be honest you can see it's going a bit haywire at the moment um, and that's just down to the fact I really need to composite mod it but it's the only one I have and I don't want to really tamper with it so I may have to just live with it. Yes, I know people are going to be putting in the comments slating me for it, but that's just what I want. I want an original machine, untouched, unbrutalized, just functional. Wow, this thing's still going. Okay, bear with me while I go and check and see if I've actually got any software. Well, I've been digging. I've managed to get some software. And I was about to set up the SVI CAS to load everything in, but I've made a bit of a mistake. Guess who forgot when he was down at his storage unit to pick up a set of standard earphone connectors. I actually don't have a set here. I do work out of my dining table. Uh, this is actually my dining table underneath here. And out of all the leads I've got here, I don't have a normal set phono leads. I can't believe that. So apologies, I'm going to have to stop the video here. I will do a reassembly. And I'll have to do a follow-up video at another point showing this loading some software and working. What an idiot. Well, for where we've got to, thank you for watching. Please remember to like and subscribe and hopefully I'll catch you on the next Retro Crazy or Retro Crazy Minibyte.